December 30th, 1903, a fire broke out in what was then the brand new Iroquois Theater. It had only been open for six weeks when that fire, before that fire started. Uh, the theater, because they were having problems with fires and theaters all across the country, the owners of the theater, those designing and building it, were billing this theater as it was going to be completely and totally fireproof. You guys remember the Titanic? <laughs> you know what happened to the Titanic? <laughs> it sunk. Uh, these guys had the same kind of luck. Now, they were scheduled to open this theater before the holiday season in 1903, but they only started construction on it a few months before this. You know construction doesn't happen that quickly. But the owners of the theater desperately wanted this theater opened before the holidays because they thought that would be their better money-making time. Wait till January, February, later in the year, coldest months of the year here. They didn't think they'd do as well. So in order to get their theater open when they wanted it to, they ended up paying off all the city inspectors to pass it through inspection even though it wasn't ready. So it does open. About the first six weeks or so, everything's going pretty well. December 30th, you have an afternoon matinee performance of the first play that was going on here. Uh, it was a, a children's comedy starring a well-known comedian at the time. His name was Eddie Foy. Now, this was a children's comedy about a man who murders his wife and hangs him on meat hooks in his closet. The first act of that play goes off just fine. About halfway through the second act, a spotlight above the stage shorts out. When this spotlight shorts out, it throws sparks in an area below it where they stored some things for the sets. Costumes, some paint, some paint thinners, ends up igniting this area. Now, initially, no one panics. They were told this theater was fireproof. Supposedly, it had a fireproof curtain that went down the center of it, which the curtain, fireproof curtain was made of asbestos and wood pulp. Eddie Foy, the lead of the play, even kind of gets up on stage, tells people, yeah, there's a little fire, not to worry, the theater's fireproof. If we have to exit, we'll exit in a very calm manner. He even starts singing them a little song. The first sign of panic is as the fireproof curtain's coming down, it doesn't make it, it snags. Even attempts to manually pull it down, can't do it. So that's when people start exiting the building. Cast and crew leave first, opening doors that let air into the building, causing the backdraft effect, throwing fireballs right back into the theater. And that's kind of like when all hell breaks loose. Everybody starts running for the exits. Now, one of the reasons they were saying this is going to be fireproof is it's supposed to have more fire exit doors than any other theater in the world. But initially, nobody could find the exit doors because the owners of the theater didn't bother to put any marking or lighting above them, thinking that would be distracting from the show. Even when they found the exit doors, people couldn't get out of them too easily because they were all locked with huge deadbolt locks. Again, the owners of the theater locked them that way, not wanting people to sneak in and get a free show. So it was almost impossible for people to unlock these in the dark with fire burning behind you and people screaming to get out of the theater. Up in the balcony, which would have been somewhere way up here, people start exiting the doors leading to the fire escapes when roughly about 120 some people end up falling to their death in this alley right back here. This alley was called Death's Alley in the newspapers the very next day, which we still call it that today. Now, why so many people fell to their death when they tried to exit the building leading to the fire escapes is because they hadn't completed the fire escapes. There was something there, but not enough to hold all of these charging people coming out of the building. Not realizing that there wasn't enough to hold them all, people opened the doors, start charging out, and they ended up falling to their death back here. People couldn't get out of the back end of the building. They ran toward the front end, the marquee around the corner where they came in. But even then, they couldn't get out of the building so easily. If you were to exit any, any building here in downtown Chicago, it would have a bar on it. You push the bar out and the door opens outward. In the original Iroquois Theater, the doors didn't open that way. They pulled inward. So again, in everybody's haste to get out of the building, they're all up against these doors and they cannot pull them back. Now, things get even worse than this. Now, the majority of people do die right behind those exit doors uh, because the firemen are not here. They never responded. 
and a, a stagehand who got out of the building realizes this. He pulls a manual fire alarm on uh, Randolph and Dearborn streets. That is the first alarm the fire department receives because the alarm inside the building had never been connected. The sprinkler system, they didn't bother to hook that up either. They say by the time the firemen came, the fire had almost put itself out. What, what they, when they opened the doors beyond the marquee, they were met with a very eerie silence and all these dead bodies stacked up in rows. Eventually over 600 people, about 602 people died in this fire. It is the single deadliest building fire in terms of loss of life in American history. Single deadliest theater fire anywhere in the world. And can any of you guess in the aftermath of all this, how many people paid fines or went to jail for what happened here? You are very close. One person went to jail, and that person was a man caught pickpocketing the dead bodies in the alley out here. The owners of the theater, those designing it, those that let it pass through all these inspections, were brought up on charges, but because they had already paid off all of the city judges, charges were all dismissed. Now, ghosts are definitely reported in the theater, have been for many years, especially when the cast and crew are here during rehearsals. They'll be on the stage, they look up in the balcony, and they see these shadow figures moving throughout the balcony. Uh, they also have reports of, like, encountering people. There's somebody right there. Encountering people uh, on the back stairs in, like, older period costumes. Uh, a play a few years ago called Wicked ran here. In that play, in the original cast, was an actress named Anna Gasteyer, who came from the Second City Comedy Club here in Chicago. She did a stint on Saturday Night Live. She does one of those celebrity ghost story shows talking about her experiences here during Wicked. There was a feeling of incredible sadness and incredible calm, not in the children so much, but in the mother. And the cast and the crew did have a number of encounters. People tend to encounter things here in the alley. I mean, over 100 people did die in this alley. Uh, a lot of strange pictures, especially along the back walls here. For whatever reason, we tend to get a lot of strange pictures on the ghost tours uh, in this alley. I had a friend who had psychic ability, claimed to have psychic abilities, uh, who would not, he would come with me to help on a lot of the tours. He would not come in this alley. He would get to the corner right there and he would say he feels too much energy here he cannot go beyond that part right there they were using buildings as makeshift morgues in 1903 Marshall Field let them use the eighth floor of his department store to turn into a little triage hospital and makeshift morgue for the victims and there are lots of stories of the eighth floor of that building being haunted to this day. There's been, I think, several different suicides that have taken place there. Uh, they used to have the new employee lockers there, but a lot of the new employees would experience weird things and didn't want to continue working in the store because of that, so they moved the lockers out of there. Last time I was in the building, which has probably been about two or three years now, uh, they had actually closed off the eighth floor. The only good you eventually get coming out of this fire is it does change the fire code laws. All public buildings have to have clearly marked and lit fire exit doors and ones that can be easily opened too. All public buildings have to have operational fire alarms and sprinkler systems. The way the codes wrote before that time, it was kind of like only an optional thing. You really didn't have to have those and they definitely were not enforced. And uh, even though they had kind of started doing it a little bit before this uh, happened, it really put into effect the law that all public buildings, the doors cannot open inward. They all have to open outward. But that was the only good that ever came of this.